the, the central plank for us uh, for this year's D3 is really all about access and the way access is redefining it itself in light of the COVID situation and the WHO roadmap shifts. Um, we've come now to the uh, first of the disease focused sessions for the day. You heard earlier some of the great work going on in places like Gombe in Nigeria in terms of uh, anti-venoming. We've heard, also heard from um, new facilities that have gone up in Pakistan in terms of um, local anti-venom response. Um, I wanted to um, quickly introduce the panel to everyone. We're delighted and honoured to have the chair, Rob, Professor Robert Harrison, from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, the Centre for Snake Bite Research and in Interventions, as the chair. He's going to be talking about research to address the disease burden of tropical snake bite, the challenges, as well as the progress. Um, we're also being joined by the African Snake Bite Research Group, the Scientific Research Partnership for Neglected Tropical Snake Bite at the CSRI, the Centre for Snake Bite Research and Interventions at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, uh, by Dr. Cecilia Negari, Dr. Frank Tiani, and Dr. Rachel Clare. Um, so round of applause and, and good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand over everything to the chair, to Professor Harrison. Thank you very much, Karen and, and, and uh, Marianne for inviting us to, to, to give this talk to um, the International Society of Neglected Tropical Diseases. Um, and what we want to do today is to describe to you our challenges and, and progress um, in our research to address the, the disease burdens of, of tropical snake bite. But what I'd like to do is, is describe to you first, to put it into context, uh, and give you a bit of background. So there are th two main groups of medically important snakes. The first group are the cobras, the mambas, the crates, coral snakes, and so on, that primarily cause uh, a rapidly descending neuromuscular paralysis, here shown by a victim of a, of a black mamba um, with, with ptosis, the inability to open their eyes because of the paralysis of the, of the eyelid muscles. The other main group of medically important snakes are the vipers, adders, rattlesnakes, and so on, that primarily cause a, a, a hemorrhage and also uh, affect coagulopathy. Here in this victim of a sore scale viper in Nigeria, you're seeing the, the, the first signs of systemic en envenoming because of the bleeding from the gums as a result of the uncontrolled bleeding caused by envenoming of this snake. The next thing to talk about really is that antivenom can be an effective treatment of snake bite. Um, antivenom is, is immunoglobulins purified from venom immunized horses uh, and Frank will, will describe that in more detail later. But what is important here is to understand that despite antivenom being an effective treatment when it's available, when it's the right antivenom, Snake bite still causes, still bites a, at least two, 2 million people every year. And this is a map of global mortality. The, the, the darker the color, the greater the mortality. And I think you can see first that it's the same people that are affected by all the other entities that are dying from snake bite. And the second most important point is that it's snake bite victims in Africa and Asia that suffer most from, from snake bite deaths, which globally are estimated between 81,000 and 138,000, with most, most of those, as I said, dying in Asia and Africa. To put that into context of other prevailing diseases, this means that every year, a quarter of the number of people that die from malaria are dying from snake bite. And in India alone, where 56,000 people are dying from snake bite. This is equivalent to half the number of people that are dying from HIV. To try and understand that, that association between um, mortality and, and different countries in Africa and Asia, we undertook a study back in 2009, looking at the mortality rates in all the different countries versus the government per capita expenditure on health. 
And what I hope you can see immediately that those countries that spend the least on health have the highest snake bite mortality rates. And that's why it's important, uh, we believe, to recognize that snake bite is a disease of rural tropical poverty. And that's emphasized in this next slide, where in the same study, what we did is we took a look at the country's mortality rates versus their, their quality of life. So this was taken from a human development index uh, formula, looking at the attainment of, of education levels and literacy levels, income and life expectancy. And again, I hope it's quite clear that those countries with the lowest quality of life have the highest snake bite mortality burdens. And what I'm going to do now is, is pass you over to Cecilia Angari, who's a clinical research nurse in Nairobi, Kenya, working with the Kenya Snake Bite Research and Intervention Center to focus more now on the issue in sub-Saharan Africa. Cecilia, over to you. So thank you very much, Rob, um, for this. And I've turned off my video because uh, for the sake of the maximum internet connection. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, mortalities and morbidities uh, in relation to snake bites in Africa, and also um, the barriers encountered by snake bite victims while seeking medical care. So when we talk about uh, mortality, um, like Rob has mentioned, we have an estimate of 32,000 um, annual deaths. And suddenly the young men uh, involved in agricultural activities, which is their main cause of income, source of income, are at the highest risk, affecting the overall um, economic stability of these communities. Um, secondly, um, children are the second highest risk group since um, most of them are likely involved in animal grazing and um, ongoing activities. Uh, this shows how much, um, uh, the, how much at risk these vulnerable communities are. Now, about 68% of the snake bite victims are seen uh, uh, to seek alternative treatment, such as traditional healers, um, rather than hospital treatment. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, when you talk of um, the morbidity cases, snake bite causes um, symptoms, as you can see in the images, such as blistering and tissue necrosis. So the first image there is showing uh, massive blistering, and the second shows a uh, uh, tissue necrosis, um, which leads to significant physical disabilities. So uh, the, the images here are showing some of these disabilities to include amputations. That's it, or the gentleman with the white vest um, and uh, stigmatizing disabilities. Um, so uh, Chipox in 20, uh, 2011 reported an estimate of 100,000 surviving victims and 8,000 amputations. So we can already see how much of an effect this is going to have in terms of socioeconomic and other aspects. Okay, next slide. So um, it's needless to say that uh, um, snake bite victims also suffer from a, a silent psychological morbidities which most often go unnoticed. And this will include um, uh, com comorbidities such as depression, and um, post-traumatic post stress disorder. So this is usually um, related to income loss associated with the physical morbidities mentioned. So in, in the case of the, 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 the people losing their arms and legs, they're usually not able to continue with their daily activities. So this will definitely uh, cause the, the, physical, the psychological morbidities. And even the cases of mortalities where we have these people, the families lo losing their breadwinners, therefore affecting uh, the socioeconomic uh, situation. However, little data exists from, uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa to prove it. Next slide. So um, a study in 16 West African countries was done by Habib in 2015, which reported a significant 320,000 disability adjusted life years. And most of this data is from um, mortality cases. 
this has definitely created, greatly um, impacted on their on the social economic growth of these countries, as most of these victims um, are unable to perform their daily activities uh, and lose their lives um, secondary to their associated comorbidities. Next slide. So I'm here, I'm going to talk more on the barriers associated with by snake bite victims while seeking medical health care, hence leading to the comorbidities and the mortalities that I've just uh, mentioned. So um, a major population at risk in, in sub-Saharan Africa of snake bites reside in remote, rural, and impoverished, impoverished um, communities which is, uh, uh, as you can see in this slide, we have homes that are um, grass thatched and made of temporary walls through which snakes can easily enter, as you can see in the image. Um, we also have people, and especially children, sleeping on the floor, further risking um, uh, or increasing the risks of being beaten when these snakes come in looking for food or water. So, um, Another barrier um, uh, as shown by the images uh, is that most victims either conduct self-treatment or consult traditional healers who conduct several ineffective and sometimes harmful techniques. So this is shown by the images such as the use of a black stone, as Rob has pointed it there, and also um, application of herbal ointment, a gray looking, uh, powderly ointment that, that is applied. Some victims even go on and cut the affect, around the affected area, which usually causes even more harm, especially in hematoxic snakes. So it causes more hemorrhage. Um, and the other, big, uh, the, the other image shows application of a plastic tourniquet. Now this usually, uh, and we have seen this in Africa, and especially in Kenya, where they apply these tourniquets and uh, during, because snake bites cause a lot, causes significant limb swelling. So it causes ischemia on the affected limb, then therefore leading to amputations. <clears throat> um, so another uh, barrier is, is that uh, most of these people live where there are poor inaccessible roads and lack, um, lack natural, lack, uh, sorry, lack um, uh, rural ambulance services, which also contribute to delays in getting to a medical facility. Therefore, uh, we see that victims are often forced to walk or travel long hours before reaching the nearest either all seasonal roads to get uh, transport or uh, health facilities. And some of these uh, victims are even forced, are even carried on their backs up to the, uh, the, the, the area where they can get the nearest health facility. Now, this, the, the walking for long distances causes a very major effect on the, on, the, on the turnout of a snake bite case because, as we know, snake bite is an emergency. Therefore, the more rapidly uh, the response is, the more we are likely to see a positive, uh, a, a, a positive result of the management. So, um, as I've mentioned, um, because of the inaccessible road, as you can see, most of these roads are, are maram, um, and, and there are no health facilities for long distances uh, to, to, for, for these patients to seek uh, medical attention. And even in the case in the case where ambulances are available, most of them uh, have the problem of maintenance, as it is quite um, expensive to, to, to either purchase or maintain these ambulances. Okay, So these challenges, um, the, 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 the use of uh, alternative methods, uh, the, the, the lack of um, accessible roads, the lack of um, ambulances will, will delay, will significantly delay the seeking of health healthcare management of these victims. And this delay is what we are seeing that costs um, the amputations and the, and, the, and the disabilities and sometimes even the now, another challenge that we have 
uh, as a setup in, in, in South in sub Saharan Africa and even uh, some areas in Asia is that um, the hospital infrastructure is usually very poor. And um, so in most rural hospitals, which provide the fast response systems to these victims, are inadequately uh, equipped and cannot support in-hospital admissions. Number two, these hospitals lack effective, affordable antivenoms, since most of these antivenoms are seen to, go, to cost about hundred to seven hundred dollars per vial in a population that survives under that barely survives under a dollar per day and from our experience here some of these victims have had to use up to 10 11 number of vials so you can see the challenge that uh, that this cost poses to these um, victims so these hospitals also lack uh, cold chain systems for antivenom storage and the healthcare workers that are that are in these uh, facilities lack sufficient training and knowledge in effective state by management and treatment. Now, these factors will result uh, or often result in referrals of of over eighteen thousand of snake bite cases to high level facilities, which are located further away from the local hospitals. This further prolongs the much needed um, emergency treatment. Um, I think I'll take it back to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Cecilia, for describing the the cultural, the, the logistic and the medical barriers that victims face in their pathway to effective treatment. I'm now going to talk to you more about the more sort of commercial fiscal aspect of this. Um, and another barrier is has been the market failure of some of the most effective antivenoms in sub-Saharan Africa, um, either manufactured by Sanofi um, or, or another product as manufactured by the German company Berenwerker. There was a market failure in both of these antivenoms, uh, re resulting in their cessation of delivery. Um, and this goes back a long way. So this is uh, a publication that, that Professor David Worrell and David Theakston published in The Lancet in 2000, describing a crisis in snake antivenom supply for Africa. And the reason for this is, is really very different from the, the issues that um, Cecilia described. It's because Sub-Saharan Africa is the only continent that's entirely dependent upon commercial supplies of antivenoms. Antivenoms are expensive to manufacture, and as, as Cecilia just mentioned, those costs are passed on to patients. Um, and because antivenoms are snake species specific, they are regionally specific as well. So you can only deliver a, an antivenom in an area for which it was designed. That reduces the economies of scale of that commercial product. That in turn reduces commercial manufacturing incentives. And that results in countries, all of this, I beg your pardon, in countries with very limited health budgets and with really difficult competing disease priorities. And that's led to a low government demand and investment in uh, snake bite treatment. And because of that, there's been an influx, tragically, I think, of ineffective antivenoms. As, ex as exemplified by this paper by Visser, reporting that having used the Sanofi product um, in, in, a, in a rural hospital setting, their case fatality rates rose from a norm of about 1.2 to 1.6% up to 12% when they switched to an antivenom that was manufactured with venoms from Indian snakes rather than African snakes. And so it was completely ineffective. And this is a, a report back in 2008. When I visited the same country in 2019, the, exactly the same thing was happening there. So here is, is a victim of a sore scale viper bite uh, showing the swelling of the, of the limb, but also what you can't see is, is uncontrolled bleeding. Um, and he was treated with an antivenom made from Indian uh, snakes. And this is possible because there's a lack of quality control regulation for markets uh, so that the ineffective antivenoms uh, are allowed to, to, to be um, imported. 
and they outpeat good good antivenoms because they're so much cheaper. They're marketed at much lower uh, expense rates. And it has to be said that another barrier is because of the weak investment in improved snake bite management by governments and international health agencies. And I think that's because we, as a, as a group of, 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 of stakeholders, have not emphasized enough the, the disease burden evidence. Um, I think it's also complicated by the fact that unlike a lot of the entities and other diseases, snake bite is never going to be eradicable. You cannot kill all the snakes in the world without massive ecological damage. Snake bite, as I hope we've described or starting to describe, is expensive and a complex therapy. And all, as I said before, in, in countries with very difficult competing health priorities. And all of this was, was as, as David Theakson and David Worrell pointed out, uh, was, was being ignored by, by lots of different agencies. Um, and that was true until the WHO recognized snake by as a priority entity and very quickly after that launched their strategy to halve snake bite mortality and morbidity by 2030. And this was follow, followed a consultation of several different um, stakeholding groups, clinicians, public health experts, scientists, community groups, NGOs, including very importantly MSF uh, and Health Action International and the Global Snake Bite Initiative. And the result of that roadmap is four different themes. The first is safe and effective treatments. Another one is empowering and engaging communities, stronger health systems, and partnership coordination uh, of resources. And what we're going to do now is describe our research under each of these different WHO themes um, and to try and describe to you what we're trying to do to, 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 to help generate evidence under each of these themes. And I'm now going to hand over to Frank Tiani, who is a, a clinical public health specialist on snake bite, to describe to you first how antivenoms are made. Frank, over to you. Um, thank you, Rob and Cecilia, for the brilliant presentation so far. So I'm going to pick off um, from where Rob left. And um, as has been described, antivenoms have been the mainstay of treatment for systemic envenoming following a bite by a venomous snake. And they have prevented lots of deaths <clears throat> since their discovery in the late 19th century. However, the protocol has not changed much over the last hundred of years. So what happens is venoms are extracted from snakes and these are injected in subtoxic doses into horses or sheep over a number of years. And when these animals become hyperimmunized to the snake venoms, their plasma is routinely collected. These are purified and the antibodies are bottled up and are used to treat human snake bite victims. Next slide. Um, however, um, the currently available antivenoms have four main deficiencies. Um, as Cecilia has described, the first one is that they are unavailable to those who need them the most. Um, most health facilities closest to where snake bites occur don't have these antivenoms. And as a result, the victims are referred to higher level facilities. And these delay could increase the risk of death or disability from a bite by a venomous snake. Next slide. Um, the, second the second deficiency is that the currently available antivenoms don't have a high dose efficacy. So if you were to take a 10 mil vial of antivenom, only about 10 to 15% of that vial contains antibodies which bind venom proteins. And of these, only about half would bind the disease causing toxins present in these venoms. And as a result, patients will require multiple vials for an effective reversal of the effects of envenoming. Next slide. Secondly, antivenoms are snake species specific. 
So if an antivenom is developed using venoms from a viper, it is highly unlikely that they will be effective against cobra venoming or envenoming by black mamba. Next slide. Because these antivenoms are produced using animal antibodies, about 20 to 80 percent of patients react to the antivenoms. However, only about However, about 50% of the reactions are usually mild in the form of an urticaria, as can be shown on the picture on your right, where there is a lady scratching herself following the administration of antivenom. But in 1% of patients, they could develop a potentially lethal anaphylaxis, which could take the form of a severe drop in blood pressure, respiratory failure, or severe angioedema, as can be shown on the picture on the left, which is a male patient who reacted following administrat administration of antivenom in northeastern Nigeria. Next slide. And um, the fourth deficiency is the cost. Um, the antivenoms, um, as has been explained by Rob, they come with a high price tag. Um, the table on the right shows the average cost of antivenoms which are currently used in some sub-Saharan African countries. And the costs range from 48 US dollars to 315 US dollars per vial. If a patient were to be bitten by a snake such as a black mamba, they would require up to 20 vials of antivenom to completely reverse the effects of the envenoming. And this could cost the patient as high as 6,000 US dollars only to cover the cost of antivenoms. In an area where most people make under two US dollars per day, these costs are totally unattainable. And this will go to further increase the disease, the morbidity and mortality from snake bites. So to be able to efficiently reduce the morbidity and mortality from snake bite in venoming, it is important that new technologies are produced which are safer more effective, available, and affordable to the patients who need them the most. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, Frank, for summarizing all that and the need for, for new treatments. Um, and what I'm going to do now is to describe the work of the Serpents Research Group, which includes our colleagues in Kenya, Nigeria, um, uh, Kartik Sunagar in India, and International uh, AIDS Vaccine Initiative in, in San Diego, the US, to try and develop human or humanized toxin neutralizing thermostable recombinant monoclonal antibodies to treat snake bite in an effort to generate safe, effective, affordable, accessible antivenoms for Sub-Saharan Africa and India. And this was funded by, by the uh, by DFID. And our first plank in this strategy was to collect and uh, blood from victims of multiple snake bites in, in uh, Nigeria and in Kenya, um, because we wanted to extract the B cells from these, these humans uh, to make monoclonal antibodies from. And clearly, undertaking an exercise like this is difficult and it requires the trust of communities. And here's Dr. Hamza from the Nigerian Snake Bite Research Institute um, from, from Bayero University, Kano, undertaking one of these very many sensitivity uh, engagements with communities that are primarily organized and get the approval of elders, chiefs, and, and religious leaders in that area. And it very much helps our research effort, and it's something we wanted to do anyway, it is to is to promote do's and don'ts of, of uh, posters to reduce the incidence of snake bite. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. We've been collecting uh, bloods and PBMCs from, from humans with multiple envenoming. At the same time, we've invested a huge amount of effort uh, to immunize baboons, cows, camels, with venoms from the most medically important snakes of Africa, and you can see how many there are, and also from venoms from Indian snakes. And so what we've done is to uh, chromatographically purify 
fractions of the most medical important toxins from all of these different venoms. Um, and we've injected those, when I say we, the, the, this is the Kenya team, the Kenya Snake Bite Research and Intervention Team, led by Dr. George Amonde with Harriet, Robert and others, um, immunizing here uh, one-year-old cows with these different venoms. And at the same time, they've also done exactly the same thing with a herd of 24 uh, different camels as well. And you can see how logistically difficult the, this research undertaken by, by the Kenya uh, Snake Bite Research Group is. Um, and they've been taking uh, bloods from, from all of these animals and from baboons. At the same time, we entered into a relationship with premium serums and vaccines, which is a major uh, antivenom manufacturer in India, to which they gave us access to horses that they've been using to generate antivenoms for the India market or for the African market. So these are all uh, immunized with Africa venoms or with India venoms. And what you can see in this ELISA titration is that the this is against um, the antibodies in the Indian antivenom and the African antivenom against the African Niger nigricola spitting cobra venom. And you can see by taking a look at any one of these dilution ty uh, titers here, um, that the, there is, while the antibody titers of the individual animals immunized with the African venoms recognize that Africa venom very strongly, it's also recognized at reasonably high rates by the animals immunized just with the Indian venoms. And that is really important because it demonstrated that there was a cross reactivity of these antibodies from the animals immunized with the different types of venoms. And that was also true with the most um, important snake in Africa that causes neurotoxic paralysis, the black mamba. Um, there is slightly less reactivity of the antivenom uh, generated from the Indian venoms to the, the, the black mamba venom, but it's still there. So we're really encouraged by this, um, the fact that we might be able to use B cells from these animals to generate a pan-African, pan-Indian uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies. And then in a very different um, exercise here in Liverpool, the team at the Snake Bite Research and Intervention Center have followed a 20 year program to look at ways of generating toxin specific antibodies. But this is by immunizing mice with bioinformatically designed epitope string immunogens. So each immunogen is specific for epitopes that are related to each of the different toxin groups. And this is work undertaken by Stephanie Menzies, just one of her many slides. And what she's done here is to immunize with an epitope string against the three finger toxin, which is one of the most um, medically important toxins that causes neuromuscular paralysis. And what she's done after immunizing these mice with this epitope string, she's taken the bloods and then compared naive mice with, with mice, three different mice, um, from immunized with these uh, antivenoms and compared their reactivity to all of these different neurotoxically important snakes of Africa and India, but also as a control Australia as well. And you can see that some mice don't respond at all because these are outbred mice. But these two mice, I hope you can see, react because of their antibodies to the epitope string react with equal intensity to all of these different um, toxins in these different uh, African and Indian snakes. But they do seem to be specific because there's no reactivity to the Australian venom here in either of these snakes, in either of these mice, suggesting that this is a very specific reactiv reactivity, but one that binds both India and Africa neurotoxins. And what we've been doing then is to be sending all of these, the, the B cells and the uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells to our partners in San Diego, uh, Devon uh, Sock, 
and Joe Jardine. And what they've been doing is undertaking um, the first series of, of selection protocols, wherein they take the B cells and then they uh, convert them, to extract the genes from those B cells, um, express them now as recombinant antibodies, and then start the screening process. This would not be possible without the very, very large, high throughput monoclonal antibody production uh, platforms that they have in IRV, which is one of the reasons why we decided to work together, because it was a perfect complement of our different expertises. And this is just one example of the many different figures that, that um, Devon has got, uh, demonstrating it in a cell sorting assay uh, against either the, um, the, the phospholipases here or the Bungara toxins. And what we're after is any B cell producing antibodies right up in the top right of this quadrant, because those will have the highest affinity antibodies to these phospholipases, to the snake venom metalloproteinases, to the three finger toxins and so on. Um, and so these, this is very early data yet. We've still got quite a long way to go, but it is demonstrating to us that we are on track to, to deliver monoclonal antibodies which should have the polyspecific binding efficacy. Um, and what we need to do next is, is to um, screen those antibodies down, those monoclonal, recombinant monoclonal antibodies down now for their ability to neutralize the in vivo um, lethality of these venoms in mice. Um, that will result in, in a fewer, many, many fewer compounds that will become our leads and they will be engineered so that they will be humanized and so that they will be thermostable and therefore ready for, for preclinical delivery. Now, the big problem here is lack of funding. This, as I said before, was, was funded by DFID. It was understood by both DFID and ourselves that this was going to be a long-term investment. Um, but because of COVID, DFID decided just after three years that they would no longer continue to fund this because the funds for this program of research for snake bite therapy was being repurposed for COVID. And so there's been a desperate attempt in the last three months by myself and others to find the funding to continue this work with another funder. But very fortunately, we, there are different approaches to developing treatments that are safe and effective, accessible and affordable that I'm now going to ask uh, Rachel, to, who's a postdoc at LSTM, to describe. Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Rob. Yes, so I'm going to talk through a small molecule approach that we're currently looking into, which is quite different to the current antivenom um, antibody route. So just to pair it back a little bit, I just wanted to go back to venom itself. So talking about how this is a real complex mix of toxins, but work over the last 10 years or so has found that there are four key toxins that are the, the key things that cause the most um, pathology. So if you click on, Rob, um, so these four are serum proteases, three finger toxins, PLA2 and metalloproteinases, and they call different, cause different pathologies. So the metalloproteinase and serum protease are often linked to hem um, hemorrhage and coagulopathy, whereas the three finger toxins and PLA2s are related more to cytotoxic, neurotoxic and myotoxic. So hopefully just briefly there you can see the big variation in symptoms that we get from related to these toxins and also that there are quite a variation and these are just the top four. But more so for this, these toxins vary in abundance between different snakes. So even though these are the top four, the relative composition can really alter depending on species. So this can be, like I said, by species, but it can also be by region or it could even be by individuals themselves. So a juvenile snake may have quite a different composition than its later adult stage. So this makes it quite complex when we're trying to target a single treatment for all snake bites. But this is how small molecules could really be a benefit. So we click on to the next slide. Small molecules have a real key benefits that they could have over current antibody therapies. And the four key ones I just want to highlight today. So the first one is its potential for a pan species effectiveness. So if we find drugs that are have particular antitoxin activities against these top toxins, and one single 
therapy, we could therefore neutralize a wide range of these venoms in a single treatment. So potentially a real global therapeutic against any snake bite. The next benefit is the potential safety profile that could be improved. So as mentioned before by Frank, a lot of the problems that we get are some side effects based on the antivenom treatment itself. Whereas any new drug would always have to go through clinical safety trials. And this is one thing that really should then limit any adverse events. So in theory, it must be, should be a much safer treatment. If we go to the next key benefit. This should be affordability. So I've mentioned before by Frank again, a lot of an IV course of antivenoms could be very expensive and just completely unaffordable for many of the victims. Whereas drugs in themselves should in theory be afford more affordable. But actually, as part of the drug discovery campaign progresses for snake bite, this should be something that's really focused on to make sure this is a key element of addressing which drugs are taken forward. They should be ones that are appropriate and relevant to element context. And then finally, and potentially one of the most important elements of a small molecule drug, is that it really could have a potential to be a paradigm shift in how it could be used to treat these snake bites. So drugs should therefore likely have a reduced cold chain, unlike an IV antivenom, and they could also potentially be an oral tablet that could just be taken. So this could make a massive difference in that the remote context that was discussed earlier in the slides, this could be that these tablets are available in setting so as soon as somebody is envenomed they have the opportunity to take a tablet immediately and therefore this can really reduce the, the symptoms and the pathology of the development of the disease before someone then has time to get to a hospital. So we go to the next slide. So I just wanted to highlight where we're at currently with snake bite drug discovery portfolios. So it's both promising but also a lot of work to do. So it's very exciting to find that we currently have two drugs Dib, which targets PLA2 and DMPS, which targets SBMP, that are about to go into um, phase one clinical trials, which is really exciting to see how they progress. We also have some backups for SBMP in Marimastat and Batimastat, which are matrix metalloproteinases that also have really good evidence of them working. And also a combination of these two that I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. So as I said, it's very promising we're progressing into clinical trials in the field but as you can see this portfolio is very limited with just a handful of drugs and only against two of these top toxins out of all the toxins that appear in snake venoms. So we go to the next slide. So this is just a bit of data from some work done here at CSRI led by um, Dr. Abulescu. So this was the first one is looking at data for DMPS that I've just mentioned. So this is a methylcholator and this model here is a mouse model that represents a a real challenge and treat kind of a natural situation. So this is where mice are given a venom. So you can see the red line here, mice are given the venom and within four hours, most of these mice are all then dead. Whereas if they're also given 15 minutes later, a dose of DMPS, you can see in the blue line, within 12 hours, all of these mice survive. So this is a real dramatic improvement in the, the safety um, against um, these mice, for these mice against this challenge of venom. But furthermore, up to a 24 hour period, a lot of the mice still are surviving and there's still scope here for additional dosage. So it could well be by this 12 hour time period, some of those mice have cleared that drug and need a secondary dose. So it's a really exciting, promising data to show the scope and the potential of this drug therapy. And furthermore, to the right, the two graphs here just show that this is against some other species. So the original graph was against source scale viper which is one of the leading causes of problem from snake bite. And just a couple of other echo species, just similarly, although not always as strong, we're getting similar um, protection of lethality. And then if we move on to another piece of work also done by Professor, um, by Dr. Abelescu and Professor Casewell here at CSRI. This is when they took two of the drugs. So the combination I mentioned before, a Marimastat, which is a, which protects against SVMP inhibitors, and Varaspildib, which protects against the PLA2. In the same models where the venom is given and four hours later the mice all die, if you also give this combination, all of the mice survive for this 24 hour period. And furthermore, again, this was against source scale viper when this was then tested against a wider range of different species from different geographical contexts. You can see the reaction is incredible. It's just really is a protective way to prevent this lethality of these venoms. So this is really exciting data to show that we have a real potential to have a new treatment that could 
be really protective against um, against snake bite. So if we click to the next slide. We've recently um, been awarded some welcome, a large welcome trust grant. So this is being led by CSRI with many other partners and collaborators. And our main focus of this piece of work is going to be to help broaden this portfolio. So if you click on to show the portfolio again, our work in the red lines here is going to hopefully build on the work done on the SVMP and PLA2 and try and build a bigger screening approach to develop more hits to then progress through to clinical trials and build up additional drugs that can go through to clinical development and if we can select the best of these combinations. But furthermore, we're going to try and look at 3FTX, which is something that's currently not done at all. So this will be really beneficial to things like neurotoxicity and that kind of thing. So we're hoping we can really add to this portfolio and really help build for the potential for having a small molecule that can go all the way through to being used in a clinical setting. So we click on one more time. Just want to give you a bit of evidence of the work we've progressed so far. So this is just focused on snake venom venom metalloproteinases, which is a bit of the word that I've been helping out with. And this is just showing a collaboration we already had, we already had with Janssen Pharmaceuticals and a library that I was able to purchase based on some grant money that I received internally from LSTM of a repurposed library. So you can see so far to date for the Janssen Library, we screened over a thousand compounds and we've already found 18 hits. So this is just preliminary screening. These need a lot of follow-up work. So into some secondary dosing, dosage, um, secondary C50 dosing against the multiple venoms, but it's a good starting point. And furthermore, for the repurposed library, we've screened over three and a half thousand compounds now, and we're getting around 15 hits already, 10 of which potentially are already licensed drugs that could be really fast tracked. So this is just evidence to show that we've got these high throughput screens starting to be developed, which is like allowing us to build a good strong drug discovery portfolio and it's great to see the talks earlier on today that a lot of the enabling strategies that we'll need to be able to progress these are really going to help and hopefully helping us build a safe and affordable drug that's orally treatment and can really make a paradigm shift in treatment for snake bite. Thank you very much Rob. Thank you so much Rachel um, for describing the real excitement, the real promise of small molecule inhibitors um, in addition to, to a, a different approach from, from the other work that I described on monoclonal antibodies. One of the things that's common to both of those, although they're exciting, they're, they're as, as Rachel said, I think they're years from, from actually delivering to patients. And so we've been quite active within the African Snake Bite Research Group, funded by the National Institutes of Health uh, Research, um, sorry, National Institutes for Health Research and the Wellcome Trust that's funded work in, as I said before, in Niger, Nigerian, Kenya, and now Eswatini colleagues to this time preclinically test the antivenom efficacy of the antivenoms available in those three different countries um, to rule out any of the antivenoms that show very poor efficacy in this mouse model. So this describes a paper that we conducted with our colleagues in, in Kenya, and it found of the four antivenoms that were available there, um, two of them had very, very weak efficacy in the mouse model. And if that's true in the mouse model, they're very unlikely to be uh, effective in, in, in human patients. And this paper was important, and and we we made sure that that, that the Ministry of Health, particularly the Ministry of Health NTD department, with Sultani Matendachero there, um, recognised this, and that has resulted in the registration of one of the more effective antivenoms that we identified in our study. So these assays, while much less technical than the ones that we've described on in terms of trying to develop new therapies are effective in, in uh, helping to reduce deaths uh, and make treatments more effective. Um, there we go. The next thing that we're doing, and this is done with, with um, by Cecilia in Kenya and, and Dr. Hamza and Dr. Garber in Nigeria, is to look at the comparative effectiveness, both at, in terms of medical effectiveness and cost effectiveness, of motorcycle ambulances versus community education um, in, in, in an attempt really to, to improve access 
of, of snake bite victims in these rural communities? What is the best way of, of getting them to go to hospital quicker? Um, and then moving now into the other plank of, of WHO, which is empowering engaging communities. I've already described before how, how Dr. Hamza, Dr. Garber and, and Cecilia are engaging with local um, communities, with local decision makers. They're delivering these public health do and don't messages. Um, they really are driving national and local snake bite advocacy initiatives, which is so important to get that information out there to the communities that are actually suffering from this. Um, and moving now to more uh, to the, the third plank, is, which is the stronger health systems. What we're doing again with our partners in, in Kenya, Nigeria, and Eswatini is to deliver these uh, national clinical guidelines. So this is what George Amondi's group have delivered in Kenya. And as I've described to you before, the do's and don't guidelines that, that Cecilia here and Dr. Hamza have delivered to, to communities. Um, we are also in the in the program in the process of delivering uh, medical and cost of disease burden estimates um, in Kenya and Nigeria to the governments and to, to health agencies. So this is subsequent to uh, robust epidemi epidemiological surveys at both community level and also hospital uh, level. We're also conducting in-depth clinical research on snake bite victims of, of these different types of snakes suffering these different either uh, local tissue damaging or neurotoxic or, or hemorrhagic uh, manifestations of, of snake bite to try and identify what are the, the what is best practice to treat these patients and to roll that information out to ministries of health and to clinicians. We are also conducting a clinical training needs assessment in Kenya and Eswatini. Um, the results of this will inform the content and the delivery of future clinical training exercises that we want to undertake in Africa. We're also undertaking clinical capacity assessments in tier one, two and three facilities in, in uh, our partnering countries. Um, and, and that will tell that will inform uh, clinical trial requirements in the future. And then subsequent to all of this, we are already and we will continue to deliver national, but also very local clinical training seminars. And as I said, I'm, I'm rattling through these other aspects. And finally, talking about coordination and preparing resources. Um, the, our partners within the African Snake Mite Research Group or the Serpents Consortium have, back, have benefited from these grants in the, in the sense of capacity strengthening. This includes not only new research grants, but the new research networks and incomes and outputs that, that come with, with these new grants and also the new infrastructure. So um, these are the new facilities created in Nigeria, in India and in Kenya uh, with fully equipped labs, with grant management expertise instilled in, 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 the, in the different um, uh, partnering labs. And what I did want to say, and I mentioned this very briefly at the very beginning, we have these different programs, but it actually is a very cohesive research effort. Um, and our partners in, in the African Snake Bite Research Group and Serpents represent the largest, at least some of the 96, there's probably 120 odd, um, of, of scientists with different technical expertises um, using those skill sets in many different countries, but all devoted to just tropical snake bite. And here's members of, of the Nigerian Snake Bite Research and Intervention Center that couldn't be with us today. Professor Abdul Razak Habib uh, leads that group. And this is uh, Dr. Kartik Sunagar and some of his uh, team members in, in uh, Bangalore Indian Institutes of Sciences. Um, so we are, we are building this capacity also, as I mentioned previously, for future clinical trial sites. 
Um, so I hope what I've we've been able to portray today is that we have been undertaking research that tries to help the WHO achieve each of its different planks to halve snake bite mortality and morbidity by 2030. Um, we do hope that in that time there will be a paradigm shift in snake bite treatment by delivering therapies at the beginning of the patient's pathway to treatment rather than as currently at the very end of that pathway. Um, and on that note, I'd just like to thank you for listening. Thank you for all of you who have been working on snake bite research and um, also for these funders who've, who've changed the, what we can do for snake bite, particularly the Wellcome Trust, who have, some of you may not know this, invested uh, 80 million pounds for the development of research to, to help the WHO achieve its targets. So thank you very much. And I think we're now open to questions. Thank you very, very much, Robert, and everybody on that panel. A round of applause. A fantastic um, effort there in terms of uh, the snake bite research uh, effort worldwide. So what I'd like to ask first, really, is um, given the WHO's uh, the shifts in terms of the WHO NTD roadmap to 2030, um, one of those being a more of an emphasis on country ownership and given what you said earlier in terms of uh, the funding not drying up but being rep repositioned because of covid um what would be your message as the snake bite um african snake bite research group per se what would be your message to the governments of, of those of endemic countries uh, where snake bite prevalence is very high um what would be your message to them to unlock the political will and the investment capital in those countries? What would be your, your message to those? Uh, Cameron, I think that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, it's really important that we get the, the support of governments in this. Um, and, and we've gone a long way already. So for, for the WHA, the World Health Assembly, to approve the WHO's notion of, of creating snake bite as a priority NTD, that required the support of multiple governments. And we got that. I think it was like 36 different countries supported that, that initiative. And so I think we're partly the way there now. Um, but clearly, as you say, there will be some donors that, that will be now looking much closer to COVID than to other diseases that they supported in the past. Um, and I think in some ways you can understand that COVID is, is a life-threatening epidemic. Um, snake bite is not an epidemic, but it's been around forever. Um, it will continue to cause deaths on an annual basis uh, unless we get greater investment. And what we have been doing, and, and I think successfully in many countries, through the action of our partners in country, is to get the engagement. People, I think governments are better understanding that snake bite does cause a burden, that it can, that burden can be addressed by investment in better education campaigns to reduce incidents, but also better delivery of, of, of antivans or of treatments. That's a great answer. Um, I mean, there's a lot of momentum there. You've, you've, you hit, you've, you've said it really well there, Robert, in terms of the advocacy um, momentum that's really been part of the success in terms of getting snake bite into the, the mindset uh, that's out there. Um, we've had some questions come in through, um, and one of those is from Paul Ho. He's asking, does snake bite impact livestock significantly, and should this be factored in when assessing the economic impact of snake bite? I suppose that's alluding to building the socio-economic case towards governments as they're realigning their economies post-COVID in terms of the potential negative impact snake bite can have on their growth as a company economically as a country and how to address that and he's asking really does snake bite impact livestock significantly should this be factored in when assessing the economic impact of snake bite i'll, I'll ask that to the whole panel i can i start that answer because i think that's a uh, we, we've already identified uh, cecilia has that that it is the 
rural subsistence farming communities that are mostly bitten by snake bites. And it's really important that um, their, their farming is not uh, affected by snake bite. And it is. Um, very good work on, on a sort of One Health perspective by the Hospitals University Geneva Group in, Cam in Cameroon and also in Nepal has identified that snake bite affects um, livestock. It reduces income of farmers. Um, and so therefore that, that aspect, that One Health aspect does need to be incorporated. Sorry, I, for some reason I turned my, my video off. I beg your pardon. I, I usually do that on a Monday morning. <laughs> Can I just add to, add to that yeah. comment as well? So we have a paper out that's coming out soon, hopefully, and we're talking about enabling strategies and things like that related to NTDs helping out with small molecule drug discovery. And we discuss in there this element of livestock as well and whether there's a potential for small molecules to be used in livestock as well at a reasonable cost kind of thing. So, yeah, it's definitely something that's worth thinking about as we progress drug discovery as well. My next question is actually to you, Rachel, actually, and I was going to ask you this specific question that um, you mentioned very, you very beautifully showed how HTS screens are yielding a lot of promise in terms of future movement for small molecules. Robert mentioned the monoclonal antibody uh, platforms and work that you're working on in a different direction. Given that the WHO's roadmap uh, has a shift in there, the NTD roadmap, which is really talking about moving from a disease specific uh, vertical approach to a horizontal um, uh, approach which would include different platforms uh, in uh, in the fight against a specific disease. I just wanted to ask you that given the success of the MAB program or, and given the promise within the HTS line of inquiry, what kind of platforms do you think are going to kind of impact on those two lines of uh, research for you moving forward? So I don't know if you want me to start with that, Rob. So, yeah. so, I presume you're kind of comparing small molecules and alternative antibody kind of products, that kind of yeah. what you're relating to. Yeah. So I think they need to go hand in hand. We need everything. We need everything we possibly can to provide something that's going to be the best option. And I think longer term, we're not really expecting uh, small molecules to actually be the golden ticket. It's not going to be the be all and end all will be a small molecule. It might well be these give people the time to get to hospital follow-up treatment so it's something that needs to be very carefully advocated that people don't just take tablets and then don't bother going to hospital they might need additional wound care or follow-up treatment so i think they really need to go hand in hand they need to be supporting each other and there's a lot of enabling strategies that can go hand in hand with both of them so i think basically it's both is the answer we need everything and if i can follow up with that cameron um and everything i haven't mentioned today is diagnosis the role of diagnosis in all of this. Yes, we need better drugs. We, yes, they need to be more available, more affordable, much safer. But we need diagnostics. Um, look at COVID, the, the value of diagnostics. We wouldn't be here without diagnostics. And yet there is a very low impetus on creating rapid diagnostic testing for snake bite. Without that, in my opinion, and Frank and, and Cecilia, you're treating snake bite in Africa, you'll know better. Without that, you are reliant upon very, very uh, specific snake bite knowledge and expertise to know whether an individual has been bitten by a venomous snake, bitten by a dangerous venomous snake, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if you want to continue with that, Frank and Cecilia. Yeah, um, thank you, Rob, for bringing that up. Um, I mean, um, currently, physicians basically have to rely on what's written at the back of a vial of antivenom to know whether or not they can administer it to a patient. And without having the details on the biodiversity of the snakes in the region, they just have to assume that any snake bite could be potentially dangerous. And also with the low human resource capacity, the time to be able to dedicate enough time for follow up on just a single patient to be able to record the progress in the envenoming, it's not available. So Ralph has brought up a really important point, which is to improve um, the diagnostic capacity to have bedside um, tests, which could rapidly detect whether a patient has been bitten and why not which snake has 
bits in the patient. So yeah, that's it's really and it's even point. more important, as Frank says, because at the moment you have to wait to see signs of clinical uh, systemic envenoming before you you are permitted to give an antivenom, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's a delay. If we had a diagnostic test that would tell you immediately, yes, you got venom in your circulation, give antivenom now, you could save hours of, of distress and harm to those snake-like victims. No, I, I agree with you, Rob. Um, I can share an experience where we have had a case where a child died after, after uh, coming to hospital and this child was being treated with respiratory, unknown causes of respiratory distress. Only in postmortem was it discovered that it was a snake bite after seeing the fans. So with, with this rapid diagnostics, it would be very, very, very vital and very helpful to physicians and health workers these countries to be able to rapidly identify a snake bite and uh, either venomous or non venomous and to act accordingly. Yeah. I think some fantastic answers there. I was going to come to Cecilia. Uh, uh, you you put a very uh, interesting slide up in a series of slides at the beginning of the uh, presentation about the access barriers that the patients are, are, are. And part of that was the treatment pathway in terms of what they would normally go down in terms of get the traditional healer and the kind of uh, they go down there. Um, we're getting uh, we're getting um, questions coming through. So from Mawali Leslie Aglanu um, is asking uh, from I believe Germany, the KCCR in Germany, asking evidence shows that most snake bite victims visit traditional healers for treatment. Do you think it will be beneficial to assess the clinical efficacy of traditional remedies? Um, yes, it, it, it actually is, and we are we, we at uh, Case Rick and I think Eswatini in Nigeria are taking that up in terms of we are engaging, we are now engaging this traditional healers to be able to better understand what kind of remedies they are using. And then it is until these remedies are taken up and maybe uh, some studies run to them, run through them to be able to identify the, eff the efficacy or the, the, the need to use this. Um, um, these uh, uh, herbal remedies, but until this has been proven preclinically, I think it's still advisable to um, educate this uh, the traditional healers on the need to, uh, to, 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 to mention the need to visit, to visit a health facility until we come up with a scientifically proven evidence that these herbal remedies actually work. Yeah. Uh, Cameron, if I can add a comment to that. Um, there is increasing work on, on um, engaging with traditional healers and some work that we're just about to publish, hopefully, in, in, in PLOS NTD in, in Ghana looked at the, the perception of, of traditional healers to conventional medical hair, care. And what was striking is that a number of those traditional healers wanted to help. They did not, they're not doing it for commercial gain. They're doing it because they wanted to help their communities in which they are so close. And they wanted greater engagement with the medical facilities, but didn't know how to access it. And they tend to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, Frank and Cecilia, they tend to be pretty good diagnosticians. They can tell whether a snake bite victim is close to, to, to death or, or close to severe harm or not. And, and we can use that diagnostic prowess if we can engage them to be part of that pathway. I think that's a huge point, Rob, what you've made there. And I think that's a fundamental point in, in, in this, these morning sessions, actually. That question was actually from the KCCR in Ghana. I said Germany, but it was actually from Ghana, from Mawali, Leslie, Aglanu. It was his work. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> great question and, and great just, answer. Can I just add something, Rob? Yeah. Um, I think uh, 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 there's a there's a lot of avenue for synergy between traditional healers and uh, medical practitioners, and especially so because these traditional healers know the venomous snakes and they know where these snakes are. And as Rob said, they're able to rapidly identify signs of severe envenoming amongst patients, and they could be a very important first line or first referral line 
the patients who are bitten by uh, venomous snakes and they, from there they could be rapidly expedited to health facilities so a lot of avenues for synergy between both I, I think there are massive points you're making here and i suppose the question i was going to ask you really um and you know i i can ask this to, to frank uh, if, if that's okay with everybody was that what kind of as you move forward obviously you're going to have a lot of unit costs for the platforms you use use and the kind of hard science of it all, whether it's a MABS or the small molecule approach, a lot of investment in that in that for you. But simultaneously, and it, as has been shown, it's very, very important to have that kind of uh, mechanism in place where the uh, the access requirements, or in this case, the uh, how to put the quali almost qualitative um, information coming from traditional healers, the community themselves, that has to be channeled in some kind of coherent way. And I'm wondering what kind of mechanisms have you, are you investigating? I know you alluded to some of them in your slides, but from a, taking a community centric approach, using their knowledge, uh, as you've just said, Frank, in terms of their his, uh, knowledge of the snakes, as an example, the types of bites, how, what are you doing about that in terms of building a mechanism that can channel those experiences forward and ultimately impact the R&D? What kind of mechanisms are you are you guys looking at? I'll, I'll ask that openly to, to everybody. Um, so um, I think um, Rob mentioned something very important in his presentation, which was the role of government. I yeah. think um, governments could be a really important regulatory force, and they would have the legitimacy to come in and set up these structures, which would allow for synergy between the members. Um, I don't know how much a research institute as CSRI would, how much legitimacy they would have to set in place these structures. But Rob, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we will benefit more from advocacy. And already at CSRI, we're doing a lot of advocacy to bring in governments to help them recognize the importance of snake bites. And hopefully they could move in and play this role, which would be to bring everyone around. I think you're right, Frank. I think you're absolutely right. Um, it, the research group like ours, they have their role. Um, research groups of our partner country, of our partners in in country, are having a much more community engagement role. But we're also in, in, in touch with lots of community action groups. So, for instance, in, in Eswatini, the uh, the Eswatini Anti Venom Foundation, run by Taya. Uh, Lichka Cohen is is an absolutely brilliant um, little ch local charity that is incredibly uh, impactful in terms of reducing bites and in, and making sure that people get to get to antivenom. 